week on The Travel Show. I'm in the Alps, where the debate over these continues. Vast energy use, vast water use are the typical impacts of artificial snow. We're day tripping in historic Bath. I think it's one of the most romantic cities in the UK, so let's go. And flying high in Africa's sub-Sahara. Go, run, run, run. <laughs> This week we're in Seychevelia to see what the future holds for this stuff. Now it might not look it right now, but snow is becoming a real problem. And here in the Alps, they're warming faster than the global average. And with tourists and skiers like myself demanding better quality snow and longer seasons, resorts here are having to turn towards artificial snow to extend their seasons and to guarantee better quality ski days. Beijing was the first Winter Olympics to be 100% reliant on the creation of artificial snow. 222 million litres of water were needed to create the snow conditions, and that's the equivalent of 85 Olympic-sized swimming pools. One snow gun alone can create the equivalent of 10 lorry loads in just one hour. But artificial snow isn't new. Back in 1980, Lake Placid was the first Olympic Games to use the stuff, but the growth in reliance at Sochi and Pyeongchang showed that this is a growing problem for winter sports and ski resorts alike. Snow cannons essentially create artificial snow, and since the 1980s, ski resorts noticed that the snow was coming later and there was less of it and it melted sooner. So to adapt to that, they started to create artificial snow to sustain their businesses, essentially. So noise pollution, abstraction of water from natural river systems, vast energy use, vast water use are the typical symptoms or impacts of artificial snow. So of course Alpine resorts rely on the ski season, especially now after a rough couple of years. But to keep areas like this going in the face of climate change is a delicate balance which is why I've come here in particular to see what they're doing about it. The Alps has 35% of the world's ski resorts and attracts around 120 million tourists each year. Here on the French side of the mountains in Seychevelier, they say it's important to direct skiers to areas where there's natural snow rather than relying on creating it. We think that if we adapt us, we will be able to ski for a long time. And the, for us, the solution is not too big to do more and more snow, is to make the good choice, to understand that we have from us wind turbine, we have hydraulic turbine, and we have sonar panels, and it works very well. Uh, and we will produce 30% of all the power, the energy we need in Serre Chevalier. The, the uh, water is coming from the river in the, in the valley. We want to take just what we need and not more. As winters with unreliable snow become more common, so does artificial snow. On the other side of the Alps, in Ischgl, Austria, they see the use of machines as essential to supplement demand. Ein Skigebiet wie das unsrige ohne technische Beschneiung eigentlich nicht mehr betreiben. Man muss bedenken, wir haben eine sehr sehr lange Wintersaison. We have very, very high frequencies on ski fans. That means it's not comparable to the time of 40, 50 years ago. And even if there were very much natural snow, it would not be possible to keep the ski in the case of Ischgl until May. The Alpine Resorts are supposed to be 100% of the The Beijing Winter Olympics have promised to be 100% renewable in the energy used, and in Ischgl, like other resorts, they are turning to renewables for snowmaking. Ja, es gibt hier zwei Punkte, wo man ansetzen kann. Das ist einmal natürlich die Effizienz der Beschneiung. Das können wir gewährleisten, weil wir in unseren Pistengeräten ein GPS-System laufen haben. 
Das heißt, wir wissen immer, wo braucht es Schnee, wie viel braucht es Schnee. Und dementsprechend, das Zweite ist, wie gesagt, das ist natürlich auch etwas, das sehr, sehr viel elektrische Energie benötigt. Und hier haben wir mit dem Jahr 2021 begonnen, zu 100 Prozent auf Ökostrom zu setzen. Und auch das bringt natürlich, wenn man sich den CO2-Fußabdruck dann anschaut, eine doch sehr, sehr deutliche Einsparung. It's not on the ski industry or visitors to solve this problem on their own. And there is a desire to protect what they have now. But can artificial snow ever be a long-term solution? I think it's always going to require vast amounts of water. Always, because that's what snow is, uh, after all. And sure, the shifts to renewable energy are welcome, but we're still going to need ways to make sure that the artificial snow doesn't melt and that will cause uh, impacts as it leaches back into the soil. So. We can make improvements, but you know, let's not misunderstand. Artificial snow cannot be environmentally friendly. It never will be. I see the resorts that are often dependent on expensive, polluting artificial snow needing to diversify into other forms of tourism and great opportunity in summer tourism for them. But for now, though, with the spirit of adaptation in mind, some resorts are putting rivalries aside and working with competitors to help spread best practice across the industry. Of course, we are very happy, and we did, to welcome other uh, ski resorts, uh, even if they are not from the same company as us, to explain what we did and to give them all the figures. It's not the solution to everything, but I, we are thinking that if everybody does the same, it's a beginning of a solution uh, to the big goals we have to, yeah. to achieve. Right, well, if you're heading to the slopes and keen on keeping your footprint small, here's some things you can think about. This season saw the launch of the Travel Ski Express train. You can take the train direct from London to Moutier and Bourg Saint Maurice in France. A shuttle service is then provided as part of the package to take you to six nearby resorts, omitting the need to fly or rent a car. Now, who wouldn't want to ski under the looming Matterhorn? Well, good news. The Swiss ski village of Zermatt is reachable by train and it's car free, but they do have electric buses and horse-drawn sleighs to get around. Plus, when the ski lift system needs new cables, the old ones are recycled to make bridges for remote communities in Myanmar. Next up is Caprun in Austria, where all the ski lifts run on renewable energy. Also, hydropower pumps water from the reservoir to the snow cannons. When it melts, the water goes back to the hydro station, producing more energy. Finally, over in America, Park City in Utah is working on being carbon neutral, running on 100% renewable electricity for all its city operations this year. It's also invested in an 80 megawatt solar farm due to be completed in 2023. Well, stay with us because still to come, we're day tripping in Bath. Uh, my name is Marcus Alphidius Maximus. Very pleased to meet you. And just remind me what year it is. It's 213 AD. And flying high in Ghana. So don't go away. Welcome back to a very sunny Seychevelier. And you might be wondering why you can see a few brown patches behind me. Well, that's because it hasn't snowed here in almost a month. But that hasn't stopped the skiers and snowboarders coming out in full force. Well, next this week, we're in the UK with a new series looking at how some of the country's biggest attractions are planning to come roaring back in 2022. And we're starting in the southwest of England. As restrictions relax again, I'm traveling across the UK to see how ready the country's top attractions are, to meet the people getting us excited about travel again and hear their plans for the new normal. My first stop, is a couple of hours train ride from the capital. So 
So I'm in Bath. Now, what do I know about the city? Well, it's a spa town and it's super famous for its Roman baths. I used to get really busy with coach tours coming from London and I think it's one of the most romantic cities in the UK. So let's go. I'm told that the perfect way to start my day in Bath is with a Sally Lunn bun. So I've arranged to pick one up with a local photographer who'll help me get my bearings. The actual recipe of the Sally Lunn's bun comes along with the deed of the house itself. So you can only get the recipe if you own the house and they've been making them there since 1680. Oh, I can't wait to try. Ta -da! I've got lemon curd. I've got the classic cinnamon butter. It's actually very really good. But really good, yeah. <laughs> so Alicia, what was Bath like during COVID and the pandemic? It was weird, to be honest, because Bath is known for its tourism, so you're used to seeing the streets full of people and visitors from all over the world. For me as a photographer, it had a bit of a silver lining because it meant that I could go out and get these really amazing photos of the city that you could just were impossible to do before. But are you ready for things to go back to normal now? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> you know, I've had the bit where it was quiet and now I'm ready for the people to come back. All right, so I have one day in Bath. What are the main spots to hit? There's the Roman baths and the Thermae Bath Spa that both use like the ancient water mm. and it's what Bath got its name for. The architecture in Bath is also really famous so I'd recommend going up to the Royal Crescent for example. Also Bath Abbey is really popular. Have a walk around and take in the city as well because it's, it's really pretty. Clearly I'm sport for choice but I know where I want to hit first. The ancient Roman bathhouse which has been on this site for 2,000 years. So check this out, see the water bubbling up? That's water coming straight from the King Spring, which runs under the city, and the thermal waters go straight into the Roman baths. The year before COVID, 1.3 million people visited the site, but during the pandemic, numbers fell by over 70%. Things are beginning to pick up again, though, with the Centurions back in town. So what's your name then? Uh, my name is Marcus Alphidius Maximus. Very pleased to meet you. Oh, and what brings you here? Well, I'm here recovering um, primarily from my wounds I suffered north of the frontier. And just remind me what year it is. It's 213 AD. OK, so with the exception of my new Roman friend, you can't swim in the Great Bath anymore. But across the road, you can still experience the same natural spring with a dash of chlorine. Oh. Well, this is certainly a step up from how the Romans did it. Am I right that this is rainwater that fell in 8,000 BC? Yes, that's correct. And it fell around 10,000 years ago and permeated through to the hot rocks about two kilometres and it's gushing out at about a million litres a day. Um, have you had to adjust how many people come in compared to before? Certainly during um, some of the early restrictions, we could only welcome half of the guests that we would normally be able to welcome. And I think the interesting thing about um, the restrictions and changes during COVID, some of those measures we've kept in place because they actually improve the customer experience. Well, after a relaxing spa, I need to step up the pace, so I've hired an electric bike to get me to my final spot in time. Packs punch this electric bike. The 18th century Royal Crescent is a must-see destination in Bath. It was even a central location for the recent smash hit Netflix series Bridgerton, bringing a renewed screen tourism here. But the restrictions of the pandemic haven't made things easy for the museum at number one Royal Crescent. Thomas, my dear, as I assured you, the house would not be so dusty. We have talking mirrors. Yes. Now, modern technology melds into this Georgian house for a completely new visitor experience. Here, a Georgian family were having breakfast and we got to hear a little bit of their conversation. For your sister, she's a good match. I'm not. So what adjustments have you had to make since reopening? Well, the impact of the pandemic meant that we lost 90% of our income overnight um, and also had to completely transform the way in which the museum operates. We used to rely a lot on volunteers. Oh, my hands are shaking. Sister! So these projections, how do they come about? 
we were lucky we secured a cultural recovery grant mm -hmm. and that funding has enabled us to bring in new technology to create these film and soundscapes through the house and the other important thing about what we've created here is the infrastructure investment means we can create lots more different stories. Either go and live with your blue stocking idol or stop talking so much of her. I did not mean that. Hamlet is to be performed later in the month. One of the things that was really important to us is that we think about Georgian life, uh, that luxury, that wealth, but also being very open and honest about where it came from mm -hmm. um, and really the reality of the transatlantic slave trade, what that meant for Bath, what that meant for the people that were living here, um, and make sure that we were very, being very transparent about those connections and then enabling our audiences to form their own opinions about that. It seems Bath is more than ready to have its visitors back, with high hopes that this summer will see at least half of their international tourist numbers return. Well, my whistle stop tour of Bath is complete. It's been beautiful, it's been historic, it's been delicious, but the sun's setting, so it's now time to catch my train home. Cadmo, day tripping in Bath. Right, for something totally different now, and we're off to West Africa. And Ghana is known for its superb countryside, beaches and wildlife, but it's not necessarily associated with adventure sports. Well, one man is trying to change all that, and he's doing it mid-air. We've been to meet him. As tourism to West Africa booms, Ghana is reaping the benefits. The first country in sub-Saharan Africa to gain independence, Ghana is often described as one of the most accessible countries on the continent. Drawn in by its vast beaches, rich culture and abundant wildlife, it welcomed over a million visitors in 2019 alone. Adventure sports, however, aren't what Ghana is commonly known for. But partly thanks to one man, that image is changing. So my first paragliding experience was around 2003-2004. Jonathan was one of the first Ghanaian paragliding instructors. I think I, I adventure sports comes to me naturally, so I would prefer to be in the world than to be in the city. And I feel more at home and I feel more alive if I'm doing this kind of sport. Someone else who is taken to the outdoors is Maria. She came back to Ghana two years ago as part of Ghana's year of return. The aim of this action-packed year was to commemorate the 400th anniversary of the arrival of the first recorded enslaved Africans in the United States and to encourage the Ghanaian diaspora to return to their roots. I was born in Ghana, but at the age of six, my parents moved me to the U.S. And I called Atlanta, Georgia, my home, for over 28 years. So when I came and saw the people, the culture, the richness in the beauty of this country, I knew that I had to find a way to move back. Returning to Ghana allowed Maria to discover a new side to herself. I never knew there was an adventure side to me until I moved here and realized that I actually want to be out. I've discovered a whole new side to adventure while living here and it's actually now become my way of life. Rappelling off of suspension bridges, quad biking, climbing some of the highest peaks and mountains, the beautiful views, breathtaking. Everything is so new to me. Up until recently, the only place you're likely to see paragliders in Ghana is at the Kwewu Easter Festival. Our gliding festival has been into existence for over 15 years now. Every child in Kuru could tell you, attest to you, they've seen a paraglider before. It's the only part of the country where children have seen paragliders. No other place. It is so popular to the extent that the whole street could be choked with more than thousands of people. As well as boosting the local economy, the festival provides good exposure for the sport. But up until recently, all the pilots travelled from America and Europe to fly in the festival. 
So when you fly over the houses and you are getting closer, maybe you're around 300, 400 meters, you could hear the children shouting your name. Seeing a Ghanaian doing it gives them an inspiration that they could also do this at one point in, in their lifetime. Over the years, the perception of people to adventure sports and I mean paragliding in general has been like, oh, this is not something for us. But the trend is changing. We have more Ghanaians coming in to fly. There's a demand for it. It has the landscape for it. Today I'm going paragliding and I'm nervous. I have to be honest. And I actually didn't know that that was something that was offered here until I learned of Jonathan's story, which is that he is the first Ghanaian to have a license here in Ghana. And that made me want to support his business more. Are you excited? I'm excited. Yeah. Keep walking. Keep walking. Keep walking. Keep walking. Go. Go run. Go run. Run. <laughs> run. I was scared, I'm not even gonna lie. When he said go, I, my heart was like about to jump out of my chest. But as soon as we got into the sky and I sat down and felt the calmness of the wind, my whole energy changed. I honestly feel like if I can do this, I can do just about anything. Right, well that's it for this week. Coming up next time. Rajans in Ireland to celebrate the centenary of arguably the country's most famous and notoriously challenging novel, and finding out just how you move an entire library of very old and very fragile books. Whoa, look at this. The ceiling is incredible, and it goes on and on for a long, long way. This must be at least 60 metres or something. You can catch more of our recent adventures on the BBC iPlayer. And don't forget we're on social media too. You can find us on Facebook and Instagram. Just search BBC Travel Show. But until next time from all of us here in the French Alps, it's bye-bye.